And this is Senator Mo Cowan, who is kicking off the 2016 version of our Lives in Law and Policy speaker series. So, uh, Senator Cowan, like me, did not grow up in Massachusetts. No, did not. But came here and never left, like me. Yes, I came for the weather. <laughs> came for the people. <laughs> so, that's what I always tell people. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so, Senator Cowan's had a, an incredible career in the public and private sector, and he's going to uh, reflect on that with us today. And since this is a group of undergrads, I think you're in a good position to offer thoughts on right. that, that career path that a lot of them are uh, wondering about. So, is that meaning law or politics or what? May maybe all of the all of the above. I think so. So I think that that's that's part of it. You've had a career at the at the highest levels of both. So I think that's uh, what makes you a very appropriate speaker. So please join me in welcoming Senator Cowan. And so I just applaud for the pizza guy. And so basically, what I, I just want to kind of chart your life journey a little bit. And then I want to uh, open it up because I think a lot of students are here and would love to get advice and hear your reflections. So, so uh, maybe you can get us from, from North Carolina yes. to Boston, Massachusetts. Sure, sure. So as you now know, I'm going to reveal my secret. I'm a native North Carolinian. <laughs> um, I've been in Boston for 25 years now. I came here to go to law school at Northeastern, just across the way. Uh, after going to college in North Carolina at Duke, um, I was the first member of my immediate family to go to a four-year college. Uh, went to Duke fully expecting to become a physician. As a matter of fact, even more to the point, I was going to become an anesthesiologist. Man. I had it all figured out. <laughs> Until I got to Duke and took chemistry and realized I had no particular aptitude for the hard sciences. Um, <laughs> what's really funny though is our our first speaker in the fall, our mutual friend, yeah. Governor Dukakis, huh? said he wanted to be a doctor, and then he met physics. That's yeah. why for so there's, there a, parallel, there's yeah. a parallel there. <laughs> so, you know, everybody in high government is a, is a former or frustrated, <laughs> wouldn't want to be doctor. There you go. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I came up here after college to go to law school. Um, I, after figuring that medicine was not going to be my life pursuit, I. Um, uh, spent most of my time in the social sciences on campus. How many people here are majoring in what I'll generally call social sciences, poli sci, or something like that? All right. Any hard science majors here? Biology, <laughs> physics? What? Um, chemical engineering. Woo! <laughs> Actually, my sister in law is a chemical engineer. She's also now a patent lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> ah, excellent. <laughs> excellent. By the way, that's about as much as I know about patent law. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I came to law school. Uh, I had this notion that um, the common thread between medicine and law school was acquiring skills and perspectives that would allow me to then employ them to help a lot of people. That's how I saw both medicine and the law. I sort of had this notion I'd go to law school and maybe I'd become like a criminal defense lawyer. And, or something like that. Um, and as you know, I became everything other than that. Um, and uh, decided that my real passion in the law, frankly, was the merger of law and business. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, began to study and then take co-ops that put me in that domain, uh, including uh, learning the securities trade, and eventually wound up going to what we call big law, large law firm, to practice. Uh, law representing corporations, institutions, uh, and civil disputes, where I did that for the first 13 years of my practice. Oh, and if, and if there was, yeah. um, just to, for the students who haven't worked, sure. it, no, 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 it's okay, for big law, if you do do any uh, criminal work, it's usually what's called pro bono. Correct. Wait, so just, yes. maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, um, so pro bono, um, for free, right, is um, <laughs> learning Latin, I mean, yeah, yeah. everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so Latin. Class, <laughs> class, this, will, this will be the only class you need this semester. Right? <laughs> um, so yeah, we our, our firm, and as many law firms do, actually many legal organizations have pro bono components, and so 
at my firm, um, for example, lawyers um, can uh, represent individuals, institutions who, because of the particular circumstances, typically would not be a client of the firm, but we have a program. We represent um, a number of uh, uh, domestic abuse survivors mm -hmm. in those matters, representing them in court, in proceedings, in custody, and other proceedings. Um, we have represented criminal defendants sure. um, in matters. Um, uh, we haven't done this in a while, but there are firms who, for example, will take on death penalty cases uh, in other parts of the country because, of course, there is no death penalty in Massachusetts mm -hmm. unless it's a federal case. Uh, so, and that actually is a great way for, for lawyers, both new and old, to really, uh, beyond sort of helping, shall we say, some corporate interests and their corporate, and their corporate interests, help uh, other folks using the talent and skill you acquire along the way. So it's a good way. Many, many, many lawyers actually give a lot of their time for pro bono projects. So, so, thir so 13 years. This is putting us maybe 2006, 2007. Uh, rough. Yeah. So, just about, just about. So, you know, and then so along the way, you practice law, and law is actually a very interesting business. This is probably true of most businesses, but it matters. You develop these relationships over time, and they become very, very helpful in a lot of ways. Um, Many, many years ago, about 15, maybe closer to 20 years ago now, um, I was a relatively young lawyer. I went to this function, not too unf not unfamiliar to this, really, in some sense. And there was a guest speaker, very dynamic speaker, uh, impressive lawyer. And I was like, man, that's, that's the kind of lawyer I think I want to be. Like, that dude sort of has it all together. He's figured it out. He presented well, confident you know, wearing a nice suit, which I noticed because my suit was not so nice. <laughs> um, so afterwards, I reached out to him. I just cold called him and I said, you, know, you don't know me, but I would love to spend some time with you. And if, uh, if I could, if I would buy you a cup of coffee, would you share a little bit of wisdom with me mm. about the profession? And he said, sure, come on over. And I did. And How was he with, with the, with the he was not at Hill and Barlow, but he had been at Hill and Barlow. Uh, that gentleman uh, was a lawyer with a funny name uh, who went on to great acclaim, including serving as governor of the Commonwealth for two terms, Deval Patrick. Um, and so many years later, when Deval, uh, having left private life, uh, resigned from Coca-Cola as a general counsel, decided to return to Massachusetts and run for governor, I decided to help pitch in and help out, where I, which at the time, I thought it was a fairly quixotic mission on his part. That there was no chance he was going to win. Right. So it, it was it was actually quite a long shot. So for those of you who are not from Massachusetts, at the time, uh, there was a pretty clear front runner who was the attorney general at the time, That's and true. everyone, including Governor Dukakis, said, "Well, maybe maybe set your eyes on yes on a lower aim, office, aim a little lower, right? Yes. yes. So, and he said, "No, I think yeah, I think I'm going to go for governor." Yeah. If, if Duval actually cursed, I'm pretty sure I know what he would have said, but he doesn't. So, um, in any event, so Duval ran, and he won yeah. uh, his first of the two terms. And about midway through his first term, he asked if I would uh, be willing to serve as his chief legal counsel, uh, which I will say to you all is still the most awesome legal job I've ever had, being chief legal counsel. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the gig? Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, so <laughs> they're not lawyers. Right? And then how do you become one? Right. Part of it sounds like network yeah, well, and meet, meet people. Hang out with the governor. I was just going to say, <laughs> meet, people that, meet people that become governors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the chief legal counsel of the governor is the governor's, as the name suggests, chief lawyer. Uh, you oversee, in my case, I had about six or seven direct reports, meaning six or seven other lawyers who reported directly to me. On a dotted line, uh, each of the cabinet secretaries had a lawyer who reported to me. And in the executive branch of government, as you know, there are three branches, uh, most of those lawyers also reported to me on the dotted line. So in theory, it's kind of interesting because you're kind of like the managing partner of this really, really large public law firm who all represent government agencies. And chances are something's going to go wrong just about every day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, you know, believe it or not, that's what makes the job interesting, exciting, right? And sure. 
because a lot of people, a lot of things go right. But you know, it is a challenging job um, in part because of the issues, because you know the issues impact real people in real ways. Right? These are not just exercises, whether it's um, issues around health care or the environment or you know, children and families. The list goes on and on. And so, it was a super, super exciting, fun, and fulfilling job. And it's pretty cool because you know my client was the governor. Sure. Right? Although it was interesting in the beginning because the governor is a very, very skillful, very successful lawyer himself. And so it's always tough when your client actually knows, knows the job and uh, you, know, you have to measure yourself against him. But we had, we had great success. And then he ran for re-election. He asked me to stick around. And then for the first two years of his second term, I served as his, as his chief of staff. So chief of staff, what is chief of staff, right? If you think of the governor as effectively the CEO of that branch of government, the chief of staff is effectively the COO, right? So my job was to manage the operations of the governor's office and the executive branches of the executive branches of government, which were in our jurisdiction. Um, I was the governor's gatekeeper. Occasionally referred to myself as his living flak jacket. Um, <laughs> I was the chief liaison between the governor and the other branches of government, including the legislature and um, the judiciary. Uh, I oversaw and sort of managed all the operations. The cabinet secretary is usually reported up through me. Um, and so it was a daunting task. I remember uh, when I was chief legal counsel, a good friend of mine, who became a good friend of mine, I think Arthur was then the chief of staff. I used to joke with him. I was like, man, I would never want your job. Your job sucks. Um, but, then, but then your governor calls and says, I want you to take that job. What do you do? You take the job with a smile and you say, I'm happy to serve. And actually, I was happy to serve. It was a tremendous uh, thrill. And just as I was ready to leave government and go back into private life, because I promised my wife, also a Northeastern Law grad, by the way, that when I went into government, I promised her I'd only be there for two years. So I was already on my way into year four. Um, and listen, over the course of your lives, you may make a lot of well-intended promises and find out over time that you can't keep them. Do everything you can to keep them with respect to your significant other, <laughs> especially if your significant other is my wife. <laughs> in any event, um, so just as I was preparing to go, some interesting changes developed in international and national politics. Anybody this weekend uh, go see the movie 13 Hours? Do you know what it's about? Look, Nally. Ben Gazi. Ben yes. Ben Gazi. You'll remember late 2012, then Secretary Hillary Clinton, Clinton announced that she was not she was going to step down. And the government and the, government. the president then needed to name a new Secretary of State. And uh, one of my favorite people and professors of all time. Oh, that's so nice. Wendy Parman. I'm sorry to be late. <laughs> no, no, come on, come do it. Please. You've heard my BS before. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and Wendy, there's, there's pizza and soda in the back. So, <laughs> so rumor had it, right? I'm, this is an inside baseball, which you may or may not know. Rumor had it that the president, his first choice to succeed Secretary Clinton, was then his national security advisor, a woman by the name of Susan Rice. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rice was a very, very impressive, formidable public servant, policymaker, thinker. Her foreign, her foreign policy knowledge is, is it's beyond compare, no matter what your politics may be. And very, very close with the president. So everyone assumed she was going to be the next Secretary of State. And then the incidents in uh, Libya happened, and Benghazi and the embassy, and the tragedy there. And as fate would have it, Secretary, excuse me, um, Susan Rice was sent the to the Sunday talk shows to talk about the administration's response to Benghazi and what happened at the compound. And I think history will, will note that the talking points that she was given to repeat over and over again um, were ill-informed. Generously, let's call it. <laughs> <laughs> very polite. Um, 
And after that, as more and more news started to develop about what happened and what didn't happen, all this attention began focused on Dr. Rice about what she knew and whether she had been sent out there to mislead the public about what actually happened in Benghazi. So then the rumors became she can never get confirmed. The Senate will never confirm her. She's tainted because of the Sunday show appearances and the impressions of what the administration was trying to convey. And so she was wearing this all, even though she'd been she just been sent out there to sort of speak for the administration. So we here in Massachusetts, you know, um, we're paying attention to all this because what happened, um, we started to hear, well, listen, they, they need to go to an alternative other than Dr. Rice. And we all knew, it was sort of like the worst kept secret, that if it wasn't going to be Dr. Rice, it was probably then going to be, uh, going to be then Senator John Kerry. Very confirmable. They tend to confirm their own. Tend to right. confirm their own. <laughs> Although, I will tell you, um, Chuck Hagel found out differently. I mean, Correct. he eventually got confirmed. He had to for it. Right. Right. Um, so, we started to pay attention to the governor's office because under, under Massachusetts law, if there is a, an opening of a Senate seat, um, the governor, by law, is empowered to appoint an interim senator until there is a special election held people can vote for the senator they wish to take the seat. Um, there's a, actually a long history around that. That's changed a few times over the years. Um, and actually the first time it changed, the most recent time it changed, was also because of John Kerry. Because yep. when John Kerry ran for president in 2004, the Massachusetts legislature <laughs> changed the law. They were concerned that a governor named Mitt Romney <laughs> would have the power to appoint <laughs> John Kerry's successor, so they changed the Democratic legislature changed the law <laughs> to deny him that appointment. Power. Um, of course, Senator Kerry did not win the election, and the matter was moot, more or less, until 2009, when the lion of the Senate, the great Ted Kennedy, passed away. The Massachusetts legislature changed the law again. <laughs> to give then Senator, excuse me, then Governor Deval Patrick the power to appoint an interim senator, at least until a special election was held. When, when clearly, yeah, and then obviously. Yes, right, right, that right, was the right, assumption. Right. There was, there might have been an assumption that in a special election, then sitting Attorney General Martha Coakley would easily win mm -hmm. that race. Funny thing called Scott Brown happened along yeah. the way. Anyone remember, anyone living here at that time? Uh, the rest is history. Scott Brown, who may or may not be a vice presidential candidate, by the way, according to Donald Trump. That's different. <laughs> um, so, in any event, we're now 2012, we're into 2013. Uh, what we thought was going to happen, happened. The president, we get word that it's not going to be Susan Rice. I mean, that became known it wasn't going to be Dr. Rice uh, to succeed uh, Secretary Clinton. And so, the president announces that he's going to nominate Massachusetts Senator John Kerry to be Secretary of State. So we go into overdrive because we now know they're going to start taking an interest. Are we going to appoint someone? Um, and this would be, this would have been the second time the governor had this appointment. So uh, it was kind of interesting because I was chief of staff, and so I was leading this effort, and we were sort of pulling together our information, trying to get a short list for the governor to select from. There were some rather prominent people who were publicly lobbying for the position. Sure. Um, it, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would have been great. But, yeah. Yeah. Didn't, didn't Although I will out. tell you, if we had gone down the list far enough to get to the U's, you were at the top of the list. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, in one of the earliest meetings, uh, someone said, well, what about you, Mo? And I said, well, what about me for what? And they said, Governor should, we think the governor should think it, should consider appointing you. And I said, absolutely not. Uh, I said, I think it's a bad idea for the governor to appoint any staff member. Mm -hmm. um, I said, this, these are highly politically charged issues. There's going to be a special election. There's all these noise. You know, plus I promised my wife I was leaving the government. Um, so uh, we moved on. A couple weeks later, we had another meeting. The governor's president. We go through our short list. I'm about ready to wrap up the meeting. The governor says, 
wait a minute, aren't we going to talk about Mo? And I say, because it's my meeting, of course, Governor, don't worry about that. Someone raised that last time. I quashed that. That's off the table. We don't need to waste any time for that. And he says, well, thank you for making my decision for me, but this is a point which I remind you that I am the governor. Duly <laughs> 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 <Really> noted, sir. <laughs> uh, so he then said he wanted at least to consider me in the context of his choices. And so I recused myself from the proceedings going forward. That's what I was going to ask. And yeah. then you just sort of... Uh, Say, all right, I'll be... I said, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. I turned the process over to someone else. And the process went on for another three plus weeks or so. And I had no idea what they were doing. I had no idea what the decisions were. Mm. Um, the governor and I traveled to President Obama's second inauguration. Uh, soon thereafter, after the return, he called me one day and said, if I were to appoint you to serve as the interim senator, would you do it? And I said, well, it depends. Are you calling me to appoint me? <laughs> he said, yes, I am. He said, well, I, I am willing to serve. And so, at the end of January 2013, I'm sorry, it's a rather long story. I apologize. It's important. Um, this little kid from rural North Carolina, first in his family to go to a four-year college, came up to Massachusetts to get a law degree, practiced in the private sector, I had never really thought about public sector work until my friend who became the governor invited me into that domain. Um, found himself standing in front of a phalanx of cameras and microphones talking about uh, what it meant to be or soon to become only the eighth African American in the history of the United States ever to serve in the Senate. And then a few days later, I was on the floor of the Senate with my hand on the family Bible, and the Vice President of the United States was swearing me into the Senate. Uh, six months later, I was, uh, after the people of Massachusetts voted, I was kicked out of the Senate, <laughs> 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 having served my time, and returned to private life, uh, where I remain to this day. What so a anyway, that's my story. Journey. Yeah. That's my story. That's yeah. fascinating. I'm sticking with it. Yeah, sticking so, with it. so what I'm going to do is just... Uh, a yeah. few quick questions sure. about your time in the yeah. Senate, yeah. and then I do want to uh, open it up because I think a lot of the students here would, would love to get your advice and hear your thoughts. So, uh, you had 99 colleagues, but I want to yes. focus on four. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, four that are more in the news okay. uh, than, okay. than maybe... Sure. They are all, they're, yes. they're fascinating. 95, I'll say 95 others, right? They're fascinating people. Yes. Right? And it's like the joke, every senator thinks they should be president. It's sort of because of the prestige of the Senate, yeah. you, have a, you have 100 individuals yeah. that at least 90 plus think. Oh, yeah. Or, Absolutely. Or 100. Absolutely. There's, listen, they all think they can do the job better than the person who has it. And they're incredibly critical. Yet they all want to have the job. And I used to say all the time, I don't get you guys. <clears throat> because as soon as one of you gets it, if you get it, you just beat the crap out of them. Yeah. I'm like, I said, President Obama was just here. Yeah. Like, he was just here. And it's just, uh, so it's a fascinating environment. Which, yeah, yeah. maybe explain sort of, right, where you yeah. sit is where you stand in the yeah, position yeah. of government. Yeah. So, so the reason I'll bring up these four is just I think you have a lot of interesting observations and sure. maybe, you know, things that we don't see in the media. I think part of, I'm sure, what you saw is that the, the way the media captures people versus how they are as people can often be. Uh, accurate and can be incredibly inaccurate. I would just twist it just a little bit and say, yes. But what I saw is how people choose to portray themselves in the media yeah. versus how they portray themselves outside the media. Well put. Yeah. So, right, so uh, four of them, I believe, as of today, uh, Senator Sanders, correct, Paul, yes, Cruz, and Rubio are still in the are game. currently still in the game. Running. Yeah. Lindsey dropped out. Lindsey Graham dropped out. Yeah. And did he, has he endured? He endorsed uh, Bush. Governor Bush. Bush. He, okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we can uh, we can start with uh, with with Senator Sanders. Maybe no, but, but maybe <laughs> so, we'll, go from left, we'll go from left to right. Senator okay. Cruz <laughs> or Paul. It depends on how you're measuring, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, maybe you could offer your thoughts and also uh, how he you know, caught fire and and I think a lot of people, including him, have said, "Wow, he is." Doing better at this point. Yeah. Others might have yeah. thought that Martin O'Malley would have been the quote-unquote five alternative in terms of the early handicapper. So, 
So maybe you can just you know, offer your thoughts yeah, on, yeah. on Sanders the person, but also his, his race. I, I, listen, I think uh, Senator Sanders Bernie is a fascinating guy. I mean, if you haven't really taken time to sort of see his career arc and how he got involved in public life and his work uh, growing up in Brooklyn and eventually finding his way to Vermont and Burlington and his work there as mayor of Burlington. Right, well, let's start on yeah, local government. Yeah. Mm. Um, he's just, he really is a fascinating guy. He's even more fascinating because he is not a member of either major party. Although he's actually running on the Democratic ticket, and he caucused with the Democrats. Yes, so he caucused with the Democrats, um, which meant you know twice a week the parties, um, the two parties got together in the Senate on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, but we got together separately. God forbid we actually you know, <laughs> caucus together. And so Bernie caucus with us. So we you know we get together for lunch and we talk about issues and and, Paul, and Bernie was all you know he votes it. He votes Democrat um, for the most part. There are two independent senators in the Senate, by the way, um, both from the Northeast. Uh, so there's Bernie Sanders and Angus King from Maine. Um, Angus is the former uh, governor of Maine. Great guy. By the way, Angus was the first person to call me and congratulate me for uh, the appointment. I never met him before. He's a great guy. Yeah, that's other than six with you. So, uh, I'll be honest with you about something. So when I heard uh, Bernie was thinking about running for president, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see Bernie doing that, right? You know, right. I, it's, it's such a Bernie thing, right? <laughs> right. Um, but if you told me that Bernie would be where he is today in this campaign, January, late January of 2016, yeah, making, I believe, believe the rumors, the Clinton campaign, very nervous, um, and having created the kind of draw and enthusiasm he has, and you know, um, I mean, I never doubted that on the debate stage he would be formidable. I mean, Bernie's an incredibly bright guy. He understands government. He's also very principled. Bernie believes what he believes, right? And he's not interested and he will not be moved by the political winds. I mean, he's never had to that's just that's not who he is, and that's just how he is. Um, the famous story I tell about Bernie is, look, you know, Dan introduced me as you know Senator Mo. Everybody knows me as Mo, right? My given name is William, middle name Maurice, but everybody calls me Mo, right? Six months in the Senate, there was one person who called me Bill every time he saw me. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, <laughs> <laughs> and like the three people before him. Would have called me Mo, and he would still walk up to me and be like, "Hey, Bill, how you doing?" And I'm like, "You know what? It's Bernie." Bernie. What are you doing? <laughs> um, but I would not have predicted his where he is in this race. Not because he's not a serious candidate, uh, not because he's not a serious thinker or a public policymaker. Um, it's just, you know, you never know. I've I've found in this campaign on both sides that the usual rules don't apply. Sure. Right. Uh, it's a little more evident, seemingly more evident on the other side. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have counted Donald Trump out so many times, and now it's completely turning around. People are starting to, to sort of talk openly, candidly about uh, not just a Trump uh, candidacy or nomination, but the potential of a Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. And the, the so-called establishment is trying to figure out how to, how to coalesce around that in the right way. You start hearing, you're hearing rumors that some of the for example, the senior people rumored to have worked with Governor Romney last time in 2012 are now starting to migrate towards uh, Trump. How or whether the whole you know, Palin endorsement supports or hurts him, who knows? But um, So anyway, Bernie, fascinating guy. Um, and I, when Bernie talks, the issues he talks about, that is how Bernie talks all the time. That's what he talks about. Right? So there's no, what you see is what you get. That's who he is. Right. Right. He's, he's not pandering. Or no, no, no. And uh, I think part of it is people like what he's talking about. I also think part of it is um, there is some electoral fatigue in this nation behind the idea that, you know, there's a couple of families who seem to always be near the White House. And, and I think the general frustration with the so-called establishment politics and the reality is, look, when, when Congress has a 13, on its best day, percent approval rating, right, 
um, and where admittedly Congress hasn't done enough given all the power it has available to it. People don't feel good about the government. They don't trust the people who seem to be in it. And what Bernie has going for him, he's always sort of, you know, he's always been, you know, cut against the grain, right? Right. And, and people don't see him as a, a representative of the government first. Right. They see him as a voice for yeah. 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 And I think that's that's the way he's being received. So that's Bernie. Okay. That's Bernie. Great. Um, Marco Rubio. Now, the, you know, if I were joking, I would say I don't okay. know if you saw him because he missed so many votes. I'm, not <laughs> <laughs> sure. well, I'm sorry. That was, um, <laughs> but um, just curious about uh, about uh, your thoughts and serving with him and what he's about. So you, all right. So you said four senators you want to talk about, right? Bernie, Marco, Ted, Rand, and Rand. Three of the four, the fourth being Bernie, from day one when I walked in the chamber, it was evident that they were running for president. I, I mean, and I don't mean thinking that they could be president. We're planning to run for president. And, and, and this is weeks to months after the 2012 election. Yeah, right, yeah, right yeah, after yeah, the 2012 election. I mean, it's election. Just, it was just right. evident in the way they went about their business, mm -hmm. right? Um, and some of them candidly talked fairly openly about it, but, uh, so who did you, Marco, um, I can honestly say to you, in the six months I was there, I didn't really have uh, much personal interaction with Marco, not for the reason, because um, here's the reason why, because Marco at that time, in the Senate, was viewed very much as an important figure, rising star in the Republican Party, in terms of the context of what the Senate could do. He was, in the Senate, there are a few people who can easily navigate among both sides of the aisle and on major issues can actually build a bridge. Now, it's a problem because we, it ends up being like a gang of six or a gang of eight, right, who sort of develop all the policy and then everybody else sort of stands around and waits for them to do something, as opposed to the gang of 100 who are actually there. This is a uh, So, but Marco, when I was there, was heavily involved and invested with a gang, a gang of eight focused on immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And the impression you got from him was he was a serious thinker. He cared a lot about the issue. He was really trying to work with Chuck Schumer and others to find a path forward on immigration. But you also got the sense that he felt like if he could thread that needle, it would be very, very good for him electorally. Yeah, that's an accomplishment. To yeah. Point. Yeah. Because the, the challenge you have if you're running to the flip president from the Senate, it's hard to demonstrate that you've actually had a lot of, you, you've accomplished a lot of things, right. right? Because in the Senate, no one person can do anything by his or herself, except stop something from happening. That's the one thing you can do by yourself. You can stop something from happening. You can't make anything happen. So you have to collaborate, which means you have to work with the other side. So I, I think he was looking for this to be his signature achievement. And it would have been. It actually still could be, except I think he started to read the political tea leaves and realized it wasn't playing as well in the Republican base as he wanted it to. Right. And so he's completely disavowed it. Yeah. You know, this was less than three years ago. Right. Uh, by the way, that bill did pass the Senate. It languished in the House, so it died over there. But it was a it was a major accomplishment. So, but he wasn't around. But he wasn't around because he was skipping votes. He actually did vote. He was around because he was at least in the impression I had, he was off actually doing some of the, some important work, trying to strike a deal right. on some of these important issues. But, you know, it was, you still in the sense he had his eye on the prize. Got it. Something, something next, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Right, so uh, Rand Paul, I think some people were surprised because uh, that, that his polls have been so low because the argument was that maybe America is having a libertarian moment. Yes. He had spoken against NSA. Yes. Uh, wiretapping yes. and was tapping into yes. bipartisan issues. Anyway, just the criminal yeah. justice reform. So there were a few criminal issues where reform. he was not uh, perfectly aligned with the modern GOP. So maybe you could. Uh, I, I think that's right. I think uh, you know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, that was the conventional thinking that Rand was positioning and presenting himself as an alternative, a libertarian alternative to the traditional Republican Party, and, he, and popular with yes. with the demographic that we're speaking yes. to, which were younger uh, voters. Yes, uh, so-called millennials. Forgive me if that offends. <laughs> uh, and so that was, you know, mm -hmm. back in the late winter, early spring of 2013, Rand was seen as uh, the alternative to the establishment. Right. 
and he was reaching out to groups that traditionally the Republican uh, Party doesn't do well with, minorities and immigrants and women, and he was very, he was talking about the U.S. pulling back uh, from conflict on the world stage. Um, he was very vocal around the NSA issues, the Edward, Snow, Edward Snowden issues, which happened when I was there. Mm -hmm. you know, so Rand was sort of like, you know, he did his classic filibuster on the Senate floor while I was there uh, talking about NSA issues. And so you had a sense like, wow, this guy has very smartly positioned himself, you know, as a conservative alternative to the conservative establishment. Mm -hmm. And he was playing well, seemingly playing well, to millennials, which are the largest generation of voters and will be for a long time. And I think the party, I think some of the enmity you see right now that the, the Democratic establishment the Senate field towards Ted at that time was directed towards Rand. Because mm. Rand was being a pain in their ass. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and, and so, but lurking just over here at the edge, right? Transition. Right? Waiting for his moment was arguably one of the smartest people, I swear to goodness, I've ever met. And that is Rafael Edward Cruz. My friends call me Ted. <laughs> uh, and if you go back in 2013, who came and looked at and watched Rand's uh, filibuster in the Senate floor, talking filibuster, who came to support him? Ted. Right? And Ted is as smart and as crafty as anybody you will ever meet. And the, the question for Ted at that time was, what is his end game? Mm -hmm. Both Republicans and Democrats were openly saying, what's this guy up to? Like, what's his play here? Because he's not playing by any, anybody's mm -hmm. traditional book or set of rules, right? Because traditionally in the Senate, here's how it works. Seniority matters in the Senate. And so you come in, you keep your head down, work hard somewhere in the, your first term, you know, your first six year term, maybe about year three or four, you know, you start to come out of your shell and you become a more visible vocal presence, but that's sort of how it's done. Like you have to earn your stripes, right? Uh, when, uh, when Hillary Clinton joined the Senate, right? That was how people felt that, she, that they still talk about how she played it so well, so smartly. She didn't come in as the former first lady. She came in as the freshman senator from New York. Right put her head down, worked hard, learned the Senate, learned the processes, became expert in the business of the Senate, forged alliances, and then re-emerged as this incredibly important senator and later Secretary of State. There are two freshmen, um, two people who were elected in 2012 as freshman senators, one on each side, who completely eschewed that theory and that practice and completely said, you know what? I recognize as a senator, no matter how long I've been here, I have as much power in this body as any other senator, no, longer, no matter how long he or she has been here. Mm -hmm. Ted was one. Did anyone guess the other? Elizabeth, Elizabeth nice. Warren. Right? And so overnight almost, at least in terms of the Senate, these two freshmen for their respective caucuses became two of the most influential people in the chamber, which I assure you does not sit well with everyone else in the chain. <laughs> Only about 98 of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Ted, um, Ted is a fascinating guy. Didn't spend a whole lot of time, but a little, little bit of time. Um, he really is very bright, loves his family, loves his daughters. He said, when we talk, we talk about our kids. So we have kids roughly the same age. Um, Ted and I never talked politics, you know? Um, I remember this very interesting moment. Uh, we went to the Library of Congress. They had a reception for the new senator. At the time, this was also uh, the sesquicentennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. So they had a display of all the stuff around the Civil War and, and uh, the document itself. And they actually had on display a handwritten draft in the, in the handwriting of President Lincoln, an early draft of the Emancipation Proclamation on display behind glass. And I was standing, you know, you're just transfixed by this. And I realized someone is standing on my shoulder, equally transfixed. And I look to my side, it's Ted Cruz, right? It's just the two of us, room slightly darkened, there's a spotlight. And we're both just sitting there. <laughs> um, but anyway, very bright guy. Um, having said that, um, 
I don't know, part of me just feels like I don't know that Ted actually believes everything Ted says. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, and, and that's been, that's been. That, mm -hmm. and that's not so, to, I don't mean to paint him or suggest that he's a truthful or a liar, but I think Ted knows very well how to say things in a way that he thinks people want to hear them. Mm -hmm. And he's very good at that. Um, and I think, by the way, I think that what he's done thus far in the Republican primary, including how he's frankly managed Donald Trump, because that's what in fact what he has done, has been remarkable. Mm -hmm. And he is poised potentially to win the Iowa caucuses, probably do well enough in New Hampshire, because um, I don't think he plans to, he's not interested in winning New Hampshire. And I think his real prize is the so-called SEC Super Tuesday primaries. I think Ted is planning and running hard to sweep the Southern primaries in March, position himself for the nomination. And counting, and he was doing it quietly at first, but now he's starting to become more vocal because Trump has started to turn his attention to Ted. Counting on Trump still flaming out and capturing Trump's voters. Absolutely to sweep the Republican primary. As the remaining alternative yes, to the absolutely, establishment. Absolutely. Well, and um, uh, he's probably better than anyone right now because Ben Carson is fading. Right. Has the sewn up the evangelical vote. Right. Which is obviously not. Yeah. Right. Iowa is huge, but then in that yeah. SEC. Exactly. So right. Huge in the bottom, though. So, anyway. But they're yeah. all fast. By the way, let me say something. <laughs> We take, and by the way, Lindsey Graham, who we didn't talk, didn't talk, who dropped out and represents South Carolina. By the way, I don't know if you guys know, but you know, I'm, I was, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Democratic senator, um, but one of my favorite people in the Senate, and a person with whom on 98% of the issues I agree absolutely nothing on, is Lindsey Graham. Hmm. Love that dude, he's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Um, we took a, uh, we took a congressional delegation trip to the Middle East called a CODEL, bipartisan trip, and I was on there. It was Lindsey Graham, Kirsten Gillibrand from New York, John Hogan from North Dakota, Amy Klobuchar, and me. A serious trip, actually, because we went to examine uh, the early stages of what has now become a full-blown crisis in Syria, including the Civil War, the conflict, you know, ISIS is in there now, the refugee crisis. We visited Jordan, Turkey, and Israel. Serious stuff, but there were some light moments, most of which involved me laughing at Lindsay's retelling Will Ferrell, his favorite Will Ferrell stories. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, he's just a very, a very fascinating. But uh, by the way, a serious policy thing. One, I, I could see the next president, Republican or Democrat, yeah, turning to Lind turning to Lindsay and saying, "Would you be his Secretary of State or Defense?" Yeah. So, and yeah, I think he was also surprised that he didn't get traction. Had a pretty yep. uh, well formed foreign policy view. Yeah. So, that was great. It's fascinating. So, Sorry. no, no, please. That's great. Uh, so, let's open it up. Obviously, you can imagine there are lots of issues that I'm sure you're uh, curious about, but I'll hand it over to the students and don't be shy. And, 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 yeah, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. So, my name is Jack. I am a first year uh, undergraduate here. Uh, I have Professor Urban for my law class. Um, I wanted to know what your first speech on the Senate floor was about. Wow. This is one of those moments where I should be like, let me tell you what it was about. I would never forget this. Like, wow, what was it about? <laughs> um, wow, I don't, so, you know, I spoke earlier than like, people typically do, um, in part because I was only going to be there six months, right? So. Um, I don't, I remember my first vote, let me start. My first vote was actually to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, which was pretty cool. Um, very proud of that, and actually the voting slip hangs on my wall in my office. Um, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember specifically what the first speech was about. I do remember talking, I remember the speech I gave in the wake of the marathon bombing, which happened when I was in the Senate. Um, and that was, uh, that was a tough time. Um, you know, you, you never forget that. Uh, you, you're gonna force, is it Jack? Jack. 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 Yeah, you're gonna, I'm gonna have to go back and go to those C-SPAN archives and talk about the first time. Was uh, the marathon bombing your most memorable speech, would you say? 
Yeah, because you know why I, I was. I felt that as one of the two senators from Massachusetts, and this had happened uh, in our state to our residents and visitors in our state, that it was important that, and Elizabeth felt the same, it was important that we speak to this issue and about um, the tragedy of the incident itself, the resiliency of the survivors and the community and, and the first responders and everybody who pitched in. It was important for us in the wake of a terrorist incident to say, you know, we will not be cow, right? But it also felt to me, you know, it felt, in some way, it felt intrusive to me, right? Because I was speaking to and on behalf of people. And while I visited the hospital and met some survivors, um, you couldn't meet them all. And, you know, experiencing the bombing from a distance, as we did, is entirely different from really being directly impacted. So it just felt felt intrusive a little bit. Like, you know, we were we were doing the right thing, but I felt like part of me felt those conversations shouldn't necessarily be in front of the C-SPAN cameras and the Senate floor. It should be much more uh, personal and intimate. But it's, you can't, that's impossible to do that, right? So you want to speak to and for so many other people. And we also wanted to thank um, our colleagues in the Senate, who there are moments when the partisan rancor is completely absent. Right, and, and they're unfortunately they don't happen enough, but they and they tend to happen after tragedy, sadly, um, where you see what the place and the people could actually be like and do together if they're willing to do that all the time. Um, and so, in the wake of uh, the marathon bombing, I saw that you witnessed that, right? And when Elizabeth and I returned to the chamber, uh, we were warmly greeted by our colleagues. Um, not with applause, but with, with hugs and people asking how the people in Massachusetts were doing, in Boston were doing, and asking what could we do, and were there resolutions that could be offered to help families and folks here. So, and in those moments, you're like, okay, this is what this place is supposed to be like, right? Um, I was sent, I was appointed right after the Newtown, Connecticut shooting. So, when I got there. It was just after the immediacy of the event, so the conversation had already shifted to what do we need, what does Congress need to do about guns? Yeah. And so I imagine in the earliest days of the, of the shootings, um, the Connecticut Senator, the Senator experienced what Elizabeth and I experienced. But over time, as weeks passed, the conversation shifted to should Congress be doing more about guns? It devolved right back into the partisan ring. Mm -hmm. And it was so disappointing. Yeah. And it was heartbreaking because you saw the families of these kids who were slaughtered. Come, they were walking the halls of Congress literally begging the members of Congress to do something about gun laws. Um, and it's, it's, you know, if you want to ask me what's my most disappointing vote, that we couldn't pass or we refused, we refused to pass sensible gun control measures that were still still showed tremendous fidelity to the Second Amendment mm -hmm. in the wake of that tragedy. And it bothered me to no end that uh, in that case, special interests, and there are always special interests involved on all sides, it, it was a stark indicator of how powerful and influential the gun lobby is. And it was just I, it was such an important vote. By the way, technically, the vice president is the president of the Senate. He's not there every day. He's got other things to do. But on important votes, he will come. He will come from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and sit in the presiding officer's chair. And on that day, Joe Biden came down because it was a monumental vote. And the vote failed. Um, anyway, it was just a devastating, devastating day. But you have challenged me. <laughs> My chief of staff will be in the house. Yeah, be a source of it. Yeah. 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 So I, I was wondering, like, you were talking about special interests, and seeing as how this has become a more present conversation issue, especially in these elections, do you see that as a, a hopeful future in which the influence of money is going to reduce, or do you see as the status quo remaining the same? And can you fix our political system? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, your name? Melissa. Melissa. 
All right. So, the art. <laughs> so, I was surprised when I got down there how much we talked about money. I shouldn't have been. I shouldn't have been. Hmm. Those caucus meetings I talked to you about on Tuesday, I remember it was like the first 15 minutes we talked about money. Who was raising what? How much needed to be raised? Who was going to be calling whom? And, and is it fair to also say that it, it's almost impossible to have sort of leadership roles without demonstrating that sometimes if you're headed if you're heading up one of one of the two parties, I, oh, yeah, that I, fundraising comes, oh, yeah, with, comes with it. Right? It's certainly part of the responsibility. It may not be the reason you get into leadership, but right. it, it is a requirement. Yeah. yeah, money money is ever present, right? Or at least the. the and I, what I came to realize, though, it wasn't the desire for money that people that caused people to pay so much attention to it. It was the fear of money. Mm. Fear that, and I think that's the more dangerous element of campaign money. People will or won't do something because they fear if they will do or don't do the right thing, or in someone's eyes, the financier, in the eyes of the, those who fund campaigns, that those dollars will go to someone else who will then run against them. Including in the primary? Yes. The fear is money, the fear of money is unbelievable. Right? And if you don't, because you can have these really <clears throat> philosophical conversations with people about some serious issues, and you get to a point where you're like, all right, so you're with me, and they're like, Ugh. you know, if I, if I sponsor that with you, right, then I got a primary six months and you know I'm already on thin ice because they didn't like that I voted on this and it's amazing mm -hmm. it's amazing it's and so and by the way let me let me I'm not a proponent of funding campaigns only through public dollars I am not okay. I think people should have a right as they do under the First Amendment to support any candidate they want I, I've gone back and forth about whether I know the Supreme Court clearly disagrees with me on this, um, whether there should be limits. Um, uh, I have friends who say, listen, the best medicine is just greater disclosure. Make everybody report every dollar, no matter what it is. You know, get rid of the super PACs and all the, you know, the shadow money. I think disclosure is necessary. Absolutely. I would be very much behind it. Um, but I, I think people should be able to support the candidate they want. I disagree with the Supreme Court and uh, former Governor Mitt Romney that corporations should be able to give as much to whomever they wish. Um, um, but you know that battle has been fought and lost, at least from my point of view, and can only be won again if Congress ever gets around to sort of coming up with a crafty constitutional solution to get there. But I don't, to answer your question, Melissa, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Because I don't think either side, as much as one side may complain more than the other, is willing to unilaterally disarm itself in the campaign finance wars. Um, but I don't want you to think I'm hopeless. <laughs> I am hopeful, actually. In my last floor speech, Jay, what I did say is, you know, people ask me, is Congress broke? Is the Senate broke? And I said there's, and I stole this from several people, when I say it, you'll know it. And I said that there's nothing wrong with the Senate that can't be fixed, but what's right with the Senate? There are 100 people in the Senate. All it takes is a majority or a supermajority of those people to decide they actually want to do something, make things better. Um, what the rest of us have to do, who are outside that 100, but for whom those 100 work, I remind people that all the time, Every elected official works for somebody, right? They always like to remind you of that, but I'm here to tell you they do. They work for the voters, the people who voted for them, and the people who didn't vote for them, they still work for them. Um, I think our way out of this morass is for more of us to become much more involved in the going on of the, in the lives of our elected officials. We have, we've developed this nasty habit over time, which now works to our detriment. A few of us, not nearly enough of us, bother to get engaged when there's an election. And then somebody gets elected, and then we're like, all right, I'll check in with you the next time you're up for re-election. The reality is, everything that happens between those two dates 
is what impacts all of us in so many extraordinary ways. And the people, too, too often, the people who are paying attention during those, between those two periods, are what we have come to, know, come to be known as a special interest, right? By the way, lest anyone think I'm a hypocrite, let me be candid about what my current day job is, right? Just so I can just, um, I am, in fact, a registered lobbyist, right, at the state level. And so I represent interests uh, before the state government, uh, we have business before the state government. So, Melissa, when you're, when you're not talking to your legislature or your congresswoman or your senator, I am. Right? <laughs> Which means that when, when members of the public are not, you could, then there's more influence that can be wielded. Is that that's, that's, yes. So, so, I'll go back to the gun vote. Right? So, national polls told us when we were sitting in the Senate that 60 to 70 percent of the American public wanted to see Congress strengthen gun laws by closing loopholes around bulk purchases, the whole, whole laundry list of things. 60 to 70 percent of every poll said the same thing consistently. Here was the thing. Here were the polls that mattered, though, that were going the exact opposite. Calls to members' offices, yeah. uh, particularly in the so-called red or purple states. Uh, the gun lobby, particularly the NRA, did a masterful job of flooding those offices with calls from uh, constituents, with letters, from emails. And if you'd gone back, you could have said, like, the text weren't, you know, the, the text of the letters and emails weren't that different. Control C, Control B. Yeah, and <laughs> copy and paste. <laughs> and I had a friend. Um, I have a friend still. who was a Democrat senator. She was a freshman. Still is a freshman from a blue state. Um, excuse me, from a red state. And um, she was anguished by this. She ultimately voted against the bill. And I said, Well, why did you vote against it? She, I'm like the polls. Everybody's with us. She says, Not everybody's calling my office. She said, Eighty percent of the people call my office who voted for me, tell me, do not vote for this bill, right? And so I use that as an example to remind people that contact, that consistent, that regular, that, that people pay attention to it, right? Um, and what we tend to do is say, all right, well, no one's going to bother anyway. But people who know the business, know the game, know that a member of Congress or your selectman or your mayor or whatever, they actually do. It doesn't mean they're going to do what you want them to do, but it does mean if enough of us engage, act in concert, you will get attention. You may ultimately get what you want, but you will get attention. And right to be heard. Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sophie, and I'm an honor student. Hi, Sophie. How are you? That's our women's class. I'm well. How are you? Living the dream. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. I've learned a lot. I get really confused really easily, so I've actually followed. With that makes two of us, by the way. Oh, good. Um, so my, I, and I was in Congress. So, <laughs> so my, I have a follow-up question, yeah. which is: so if you're saying that, so there's one, there's one part on which we want, uh, not you want, but for the Senate to fix itself, the people yes. have to be more active yes. and going out and voting. Yeah. And so if we do that. We vote for um, who we think is best, best for office, mm -hmm. better for office, whatever. And they and lose. No, actually, not that okay. question. Well, well, that's another question. Right. But <laughs> the question I was thinking of is yeah. that they get elected, but then the people, when there's an issue that comes up, people who flood their offices are yes. from a different opinion, and yes. that will that will still over. So we'll, oh no, no I'm not saying it's. Does it, that make no, sense? No, yes, I understand that. your question. Well, would it override? Uh, a viewpoint they otherwise may have have an issue. Yeah, the majority of like the phone call emails. No. I'm not saying that happens every time, but I am saying that it, it gets people. You know, let's say I decided I ran on a campaign, and my theory was my platform was water is not wet, right? Turns out there's a lot of people out there who may believe that, so they all vote me in the office, and then you, Sophie, come to me and said, "Listen, I represent." The Water is Wet Coalition, <laughs> and I've got tens of thousands of people behind me, right? Now, you may sway me to file a bill that declares the water is, in fact, wet, or not. But what you're going to do is get my attention, because it's not just you, not that you're unimportant, because your vote is important as anyone else's. 
that you also say, look, I've got all these other people with me. And we're bothered that you're not paying attention to us. So even if I can't file that bill, Sophie, I might be inclined to say, you know what? I probably need to talk to Sophie a little bit more to figure out else, what else she cares about. Because I'm never going to, she and I will never see eye to eye on whether or not water is wet. But I've been thinking a lot about this issue about whether or not the earth is round. <laughs> So, it, you know, and some people look, go back to Bernie, right? Um, and I don't mean to suggest, just because the, an elected official changes his or position, that they're a flip-flopper. You know, I think you'd be hard-pressed to convince Bernie, uh, you could walk in there with an army, right? But I, don't, I think you'd be hard-pressed to convince Bernie that the way he sees things isn't the way he, he should see things, right? Um, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, I'm just saying it is. I think there are, my view is, you know, look, I was there for six months. My, you know, my, I used to drive, so I kept John Kerry's staff, and they were surprised because whenever a constituent group or an advocate group would come in to meet the Senate, typically what that means is they meet a staffer. They don't actually meet their senator. Mm -hmm. um, my view was, hey, you know what? I'm supposed to represent these folks. They're coming down to see me. If I'm not on the floor or I don't, I'm not in the hearing room, I'll sit in on the meeting, right? And my view was, I don't come to the meeting, and my staff always brief me and give me their view of the issue and how they think I should stand on the issue. But my view was, I'm going to go to the mission meeting and I'll listen. I'm going to listen. I may learn something, and it may or may not sway me, um, but I'm usually going to benefit because I'll get somebody else's perspective on this. Um, now, if I'd been there for six terms, would I have still felt the same way? I don't know. But I have the luxury of being a short-timer and trying to get as much out of it as anybody else. It was sort of a random, rambling answer to your question. Is that helpful at all, Sophie? Yes, that is. I have one follow-up question, but I also don't want to take time off. Okay. okay. So um, going back to the gun issue, so my major right now is human services, and my uh, concentration in my minor is with sustainability. And so I'm really uh, aware and active of just everything that's going on with GMOs and just food safety and all of that. And so when you look at the big food companies, yes. and you see how much money they have. And so it's this it's similar issue with the uh, NRA, 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 and how much like money in the special interest. Mm -hmm. So where does that fall into place when, like, where does not the NRA, but where does the um, where does the like big food companies fall into place when you're looking at policies and then you're looking at how like over ninety percent of Americans uh, agree with the non like, in that issue when they're then you look at the the FDA and how all the FDA were judges or are judges and they're so intricate. Does, it might be a lot. No, more no, really. I think I understand then. the question. Like, you know, you know, you've got so actually the issue of GMO food labeling actually came up when I was in the Senate. Mm -hmm. There was a um, we were doing a budget resolution, and this was uh, I think this was an, uh, a writer to the resolution. Someone had put this forward as an amendment to the uh, actually it might have been Bernie actually. <laughs> and anyway, the issue came up. It was actually because there was a debate in my office about. And uh, whether or not we should support the idea of requiring mandatory, mandatory labor, right? And you're right. You're like, okay, somewhere out there, there's the big food manufacturers, yeah. right? And who have a vested interest in this. I don't think that had been the past. You know why? What was that? Oh, it didn't pass. It didn't pass. Yeah. I think they successfully quashed it at that point, not because of the big food companies were advocating for anyone to cost you. They were smart enough to get someone else to advocate for it. So there's, a, there's an art to some of this, right? Um, and so it wasn't the big food companies were saying, don't do this. You know who it became? It was the small businesses, small mom and pop supermarkets and grocery chains saying, you know what? If you do this, we have to abide by we're going to be exposed to um, having to abide by 50 different set of laws. Which is costly to comply. Very costly to comply for yeah. us. It's a job killer. Like, but yeah. listen, you want to get a conversation going in, the, in Congress? Just say job killer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a job killer, right? The flip side of that is job creator, right? You know, so it became this conversation not about big industry, but about well, Jesus, do we want to put that kind of burden on small businesses and, and people who are struggling already, right? And so the conversation shifted, right? Now, 
But what's interesting was you had adv advocacy groups uh, who were pushing for it, but the challenge for them were they seemed, this is my opinion, they seemed a little too abstract, right? Mm -hmm. It was just sort of this group of, you know, you had big, you had big industry, but then, you know, opposing were big thinkers. Let me tell you why GMOs are bad and why people should know about GMOs. But on the other side, you had these people say, listen, I'm not saying GMO, people should know about GMO. What I, I am saying to you is, don't put a burden on me that's going to hurt my business and not allow me to make a living or and invest in my community. Right? And if, if those two things, right, you have an advocacy group who are like, hey, big picture, this is what we're talking about. But you have somebody else who comes in behind that and says, well, let me tell you how this really impacts us. That latter group almost always gets more attention. Right? Because they're like, all right, well, that, that person, they live in my city, town, neighborhood, right? I don't want to be, I don't want them to lose their business on my watch, right? So there's, there is a, and, and, and it doesn't always work this way, but, I, but I'm saying in, in that example, my memory is that's sort of why it failed at that moment in time. And it's not, so I would have been told, you know, if I were in an advocacy role at the time and I wasn't, I would have told those who were pushing for this, you got to go out and find a countervailing voice who says, you know, we can, this is exactly what we should do, let me tell you why it's not going to hurt our business. We're actually going to get more business because we're losing business because people don't know, they don't trust the food we put on our shelves, mm -hmm. right? Empower us to tell them what they're actually buying and eating, right? Um, should have, they could have gone out, for example, and, you know, gotten uh, some organic farmers and, you know, there are ways that you you got to sort of uh, counter each other. It's, it's a little bit of a jabbing back and forth. And the right in the narrative. And you see, I mean, you see it happen always in the modern era with State of the Union. Yeah. You tell a story through a person yeah. that you might reach out to. Yeah, I think we've got a couple of um, So, you talked a lot about it, um, and I think you mentioned it. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, your name again? Sorry, my name is Amy. Uh, I'm a senior. Yeah, uh, Amy, what? <laughs> Class of 2016. That's the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about like, experiences in the public sector. I was wondering if there were any like memorable uh, experiences you had in the private sector that made you transfer easily over. Or... You know, I will say generally, Amy, um, you know, one of, the, one of the best decisions I made many, many years ago uh, was to decide to go to law school. And I don't know what any of you plan to do, but... Um, can, can I do a quick poll? Yeah, sure. How many people here are thinking about maybe going to law school, or considering law school? Yeah, I'm not telling. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, it's okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> They're just not admitting it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the reason I say it is less about you know, my career as a lawyer, because I thought the academic experience in law school very, very helpful to me, and, and I continue to use it to this day to help me develop uh, you know, a different way of thinking and observing and critical reading. You know, it's just, and those are skills that serve you in virtually anything you decide to do professionally, right? And so my training, my study as a lawyer and then my training as a practicing lawyer are the tools that I acquired and used over time, still used to this day, um, uh, for whatever benefit. And so, you know, as I got into my practice, my practice sort of morphed over time, and I was representing more and more clients who were, who were uh, finding themselves involved with governmental actors. It might be they had to appear for the SEC, or they were subject to a U.S. attorney investigation. And so I started interacting with more lawyers and more players in the public sector. And it was interesting to talk to them, you know, not beyond the client issues, because those conversations weren't always pleasant, but the, um, <laughs> to talk to them about their work and what they got out of it. You know, and it sort of, it struck me in time that there was a way to stay true to the reason I actually ultimately started down this path, and that going into public service would actually give me a chance to use my talents and skills, <coughs> trying to do more for more people in a broader spectrum. I, my challenge was, Amy, I could never quite figure exactly what was the right way to do it. Because, I, I, you know, everyone was like, well, listen, go, go to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Because that's, you know, what, tip, what a lot of lawyers do. But I was like, I, I kind of feel like this should be something beyond just the law itself. But I really didn't really know what the mechanism was or the opportunity. Well, the opportunity presented itself when Duval became governor. 
and he said, come do this work. Now, admittedly, uh, the first gig there was as chief legal counsel, but the portfolio allowed me, required me to touch every aspect of government and policy. And I got to use that, you know, all the tools in my toolbox uh, in that job. Um, I remember in the private sector once representing a major financial institution, uh, and they were called the there was an investigation about, uh, there's a, <laughs> if you ever get a letter from something called the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, um, <laughs> Take a deep, deep I feel sorry for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is a subcommittee in the Senate that, and the House version of this is the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. These committees have jurisdiction over whatever they want. They have subpoena power over whatever they want and whomever they want. Um, and they don't go away. And they don't go away. <laughs> and so this client was called, was was asked to uh, come testify as part of a permanent subcommittee investigation, uh, look into uh, money laundering across the globe. And, you know, it was fascinating for me to work with them to sort of prepare them. We had to do documents. Um, we had to prepare witnesses. And then we had to, they go down there and you get to, they have to submit to grilling, public grilling, by members of Congress. And I always wondered what the members, what those senators and their staff did to prepare them for those hearings. And then some years later, I found myself on the other side. You know, and um, I don't think I actually, I don't remember too many contentious, actually there was one contentious hearing because I was on the Commerce Committee, and the Commerce Department oversees a federal agency called NOAA, the National Ocean something, something. I yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. Anyway, Ocean. they oversee fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fish is a big deal in Massachusetts, yeah. right? And there, it's a challenging time for the fishing industry, and one of the issues the Massachusetts fishing industry has been dealing with, or feel like they've been dealing with for some time, is that the federal agencies have not been nearly attentive or respectful enough to the challenges what they need to do. I dealt with this when I was in state government. So long and behold, uh, the NOAA administrator had to appear before the Commerce Committee. And so um, he had a pretty bad day, in part because I got to ask him questions. Right? And so um, that experience in the private sector gave me some sense, or at least created a question in my mind, like, what's really going on behind the scenes here? So it was interesting some years later to actually see it from the other side, and um, I remember my staff going, um, are you sure you want to ask him that question? And I said, look, if I don't ask that question, I can't go back home, right? Because you know, you, I had made a pledge, I remember I made a public pledge to the, this fishing route, and I, I will call, <laughs> I said, I will call the Department of Commerce every day I'm down there until they get you the money. And one of my chief staff was like, what? Are you serious? I said, yeah, seriously, I got to call him every day. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And I would call every day, and you have this conversation. And eventually it's like, hey, Cheryl, it's Senator Cowan. How are you? Good, good. Listen, um, we need that money. I know, Senator, we're working on it. Good. Sure, I'm going to call you back tomorrow. I want my money, right? <laughs> and then um, uh, I actually had a chance to vote on four or five cabinet secretaries there, one of whom was the Commerce Secretary, Penny Pritzker. Right. She came to see me because, you know, the, cur the courtesy, make these courtesy rounds. And she came in. I said to Penny, I said, I hope your staff has prepared you because today and for every day that I'm here, all I'm ever going to talk to you about is fish. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I understand, Senator the count, absolutely. We know this is a serious issue. I said, I know, I know. I want you to know, you guys tell me that all the time. All you need is relief. So I wish you good luck. I'm going to tell you right now. I said, I am going to vote for you on confirmation. And then I'm going to call you every single day to talk about fish. And I did. <laughs> so. What happened with the fish issue? <laughs> there you go. So, so 
Uh, eventually, they did get some funding, but it was after I left. Um, but um, I like to think my squeaky wheel eventually got his you know, So, but look, I wasn't working on it alone. You had Elizabeth, and you had all the other uh, senators represent on the coastal states, right? We all were. Uh, we were seeking some additional funding out of Congress, uh, some emergency funding, some changes with NOAA and how they were, the regulations they were imposing on the fishing industry. So, look, you know, for those of you who are considering, and I don't know how many are, uh, potentially a career, or at least exploring a career in public, uh, public life, government even, I encourage you, if you go to law school, do give great consideration to this one across the way. It's fantastic. Um, Fabulous woman over there at Wendy Parmet taught me um, taught me Fed Courts, which is a fascinating course, by the way. Um, and is one of the uh, best minds and instructors. And um, Wendy's it true? It's true, is it not? You were the first woman to be editor of the Harvard Law Review. No, that's not true. That's what I've been telling everybody. So just remember. <laughs> 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 no, there were very few of us. But there were but definitely was not. <laughs> so um, consider Northeastern in part because this is the reason I went there in part. Um, I had no, you know, I grew up I was a rural poor kid from North Carolina. I didn't really know a whole lot of lawyer. I didn't know anything about lawyering. But coming to Northeastern and having the chance to get an extraordinary sort of in-classroom education and marry it with the co-op, which you guys know well from your undergraduate studies, was just remarkable. So by the time I graduated, I had in effect three years of classroom study plus a year of practical legal experience, but still all within a three-year period. And it made all, to me, it made all the difference in the world because, you know, you know, I thought I kind of knew what kind of lawyer I wanted to be, but the co-ops gave me a chance to try my hand at different things and help me uh, decide my course and my passion. Um, and I'm not one big on regrets, but in hindsight, if I had to do all of it again, I would have spent more of those co-ops in public service, more public service. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think it would have led me on this pathway much earlier than I got there, but uh, I have no regrets. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think your path was yeah. successful. I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. Yeah.